For you, the listeners of My JavaScript Story, Loot Crate is offering an opportunity to save 10% on any new subscription at LootCrate.com. Just enter the promo code BRIDGE10 for 10% savings. Loot Crate is one of my favorite things. Every month I get a box in the mail, costs less than $20, and it comes with all kinds of goodies. I have stuff from just looking at my shelf, Batman, Spider-Man, Ninja Turtles, Back to the Future, Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, and much, much more. So if you're a geek, a gamer, anything like that, and you want cool stuff to put around your office, cool t-shirts, comic books, etc., then definitely check out Loot Crate. To save 10% on your new subscription, go to lootcrate.com slash ruby. Again, that's lootcrate.com slash ruby to save 10% on any new subscription. Enter the promo code BRIDGE10 for 10% savings. Hey, everybody, and welcome to another My JavaScript Story. This week, we're talking to Lizzie Siegel. Lizzie, do you want to say hi? Hi. Now, I hope I said your name right. I guess it could be pronounced another way. So you can tell me if I'm wrong. It's fine. That is perfect. All right. Do you want to just give us a brief introduction, and then we'll start talking about you and how you got into code and all that good stuff? Yeah. So I'm Lizzie, a senior computer science major at Bryn Mawr College. And I work for Twilio as a contracting developer evangelist. And I also contribute to their documentation. Awesome. So I assume then that you work with Greg Bogus. Yes. Greg was my assigned mentor this past summer. Uh, Great guy. Yeah, he's a great guy. Cool. Well, you're a student. You're contracting. This all sounds really interesting. And we'll get there eventually. But I want to go back to how you got into programming. How did you get into programming? Mm -hmm. It's interesting. I grew up in Silicon Valley, but I hated STEM. I was a total humanities person. My twin brother took coding classes in middle school and high school, but I did not until my AP calculus teacher told me in about April 2014, or he told some other students who were doing better than I was, to attend a one-day all-girls coding camp at Stanford. And... I listened, even though he didn't tell me personally. <laughs> I was like, I was like, he's kind of selling them. He makes it sound interesting. Like, why not? And I attended, kind of like, didn't know what to expect, and I loved it. They showed me that you could build anything with code. You can be creative. It's like making art. Like, I liked writing, and it was like, you make a story, but with mm-hmm. code. Or you solve problems with code. Yep. And I saw all these different applications and all these mentors just debunked every stereotype I had about programmers. It was so cool. I think about it all the time still. Awesome. Very cool. So what what was the coding camp like? I mean, what did they do? Did they give you a project or walk you through some exercises or, or what did they do? It was for high schoolers. So it's pretty basic. There were different sessions like build an app with Android, MIT App Inventor, or build an app with Scratch. There were classes on like cryptography and web design, like HTML and CSS. I went to the Scratch workshop, cryptography and HTML and CSS. Gotcha. And what was it that, that hooked you on this stuff? What was it that got you interested? Seeing the different applications of code. I think I had this very stereotypical preconceived notion of what a programmer was, like coding in the dark, not really talking to anyone. And it just didn't sound fun, but this was fun and creative and solved problems and addressed a wide variety of different industries. It was very relevant to my interests, but I did not know that prior to attending. Cool. So you decided to go to school. I'm assuming you're studying computer science or computer something. Computer science. I'm finishing up my last semester. Awesome. And you want to do JavaScript? I do do JavaScript. So why JavaScript? Why not Java or .NET or fill in big established language here that everybody uses? I do dabble, or maybe not dabble. I do also like Python and Swift. But as one of my mentors from two summers ago told me, JavaScript is very applicable to, I guess, every platform. You can use JavaScript for an iOS app or an Android app. And the web platform is accessible to more people. I used to work in the library in high school, and people would come in for the public computers. Uh-huh. 
And that kind of opens it up to people who don't have smartphones or phones that can have mobile apps. And I think JavaScript is really neat. The community is great with the different frameworks like React or Angular is big. And I think there's just so many different ways you can take it. That's cool. Now, why developer evangelism? It seems like more experienced folks tend to do that as opposed to somebody who's just graduating from college. It isn't very common for younger people, I know. But I have developer evangelist intern for the past two summers. Two summers ago, I was at the startup called PubNub in San Francisco. And that was around probably the only developer evangelist internship that I found online. And it was like my last shot at an internship that summer. So I took it. Uh-huh. And I had met evangelists at college hackathons. And when I first met them, I was like, what's an evangelist? <laughs> but I realized like that was like my dream job, even before I went to PubNub. That just the chance to travel, to teach. You code every day. People, people think evangelists don't code, but I think uh-huh. you have to code better so you can explain it to everyone to make it accessible. Right. So you can like evangelize your APIs and SDKs and say, look at what you can build with this language, language, this framework, this API. And you get to write like blog posts showing how to make something. So I like how it's a very, I guess, you do a lot of different things. Yep. Yeah, one thing that I've seen with evangelists, and I think this is part of the reason why, why we tend to see more experienced people do it, is because generally what we see is we see that they wind up supporting several different languages or several different paradigms. And so they need to be able to pick up Ruby on Rails and Python Django and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it it changes things up a little bit so that, anyway, they, they have to be able to pick up some of the other pieces of the, the puzzle. And so if they have more experience, then new systems are a little easier for them to learn. And it's not to say that younger people or less experienced people can't do that, but that that's generally the approach. And then if somebody throws something weird at them, they're more likely to have seen something like it. Mm-hmm. That's interesting because I feel like I dabble a lot, like uh-huh. Swift, Python. I liked Haskell two semesters ago, JavaScript. But people have started telling me to focus on one or two languages. Mm-hmm. Kind of like get your name out there in the communities and really get good at two, one to two languages and frameworks. Right. Makes sense. So what have you done with JavaScript that you're excited about or proud of? I did quite a few apps in the past at hackathons with a framework called Aeon.js, which is a PubNub product. It's a way to make real-time data visualizations with dynamic data. Mm -hmm. So like sports scores or weather or stocks, or I, my favorite project was a real time data visualization of tweets about the election. Oh, okay. So this would be like data that like constantly is coming in instead of like something that doesn't change. Mm -hmm. So what are you hoping to do with JavaScript at Twilio then? I'm hoping to have fun with it. Just be creative, get some cool ideas on something new to build. I think when you, I read a lot of tech blogs and different company blogs, and I'm like, oh, look, someone built this product with these APIs in this language, mm-hmm. and it's starting to get similar. Same with hackathons. I think a lot of the hacks are, you see them at every event. So I'd love to make something original, more original. Yeah, that makes sense. So is there something you're working on now besides Twilio stuff? I started working on a node module that returns Disney information, Disney facts, Disney trivia, because there is no Disney API. And that like really <laughs> bugged me. And I found some cool node modules that return like Star Wars trivia, Star uh-huh. Trek, basketball, like NBA, but no Disney. So I started working on that. It's sidelined for the semester while I work on my senior thesis, uh-huh. which is a Django app or a series of Django web apps to teach emotions to people with autism. Oh, nice. Mm-hmm. But I do have the Disney node model in the back of my mind all the time. 
my wife is a Disney nut. So, <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, I guess uh, the last thing that I have to talk about real quick is picks. Do you have some things you want to shout out about? Some things you want to tell us about? Do you run your own freelance business? Or maybe you're thinking about picking up some business on the side. Well, then you need FreshBooks. FreshBooks is the quickest and easiest way to get invoices out to your clients. It's easy to use. It works anywhere, available from any device, uh, on the desktop, iPhone, iPad, Android, and all of your data is backed up and secure. And it makes it really easy to get organized and get paid. You'll be tracking time, logging expenses, and invoicing your clients in no time. You can also save time billing, freeing up several days per month to focus on the work that you love, and you get paid faster. FreshBooks customers are paid on average five days faster because there's a link on the invoice that says pay me now. And it's a great way to grow your business. Plus, FreshBooks is offering a 30-day trial. That's right, 30-day trial if you try them out. So go to gofreshbooks.com slash devchat and enter devchat in the how did you hear about us section. Once again, for a 30-day trial, go to gofreshbooks.com slash devchat and enter devchat in the how did you hear about us section. I think... A lot of people have started asking me, or I've also seen it online, like on Reddit and in some tech publications, like the importance of getting a mentor or a sponsor. And I've been very fortunate to have a, quite a few mentors and sponsors from diverse backgrounds, uh -huh. diverse races and genders. And a quick uh, distinction a mentor, I guess, kind of just teaches you and helps you, whereas a sponsor, I guess, pushes for you and advocates for you. Uh -huh. And they are similar. I think there's a lot of overlap, but there is a slight difference. And just, I think when you talk about mentors and sponsors, you should talk about how you have to go and get them. Right. I think a lot of people are like, oh, how do I find someone? Or how do I get one? And all the ones that I've gotten, I feel like I've kind of pushed for. I've been like, hey, you're cool. We met at this event. Or I read your blog post. Can I ask you a few questions? Mm -hmm. And I message them every now and then on Snapchat, on email, on Slack, on Facebook Messenger. And I think they've helped keep me going. In evangelism, in computer science these past few years cool. and I hope I can do the same going forward. Yep. What's it like coming into the field now? I mean, a lot of the people that listen to the show, they've been doing it for five, 10 years. Things, things change. You know, what, what are the challenges that you run into that maybe we didn't when we came in? I think a lot of students I know who are currently looking for jobs or already have them have struggle to find an internship and an internship is getting more common and it's kind of put on a pe pedestal. I think everyone's like, I need a summer internship as a freshman, as a sophomore, as a junior, as a senior. Mm -hmm. and when in reality, like most people don't get them until after the junior summer. And a lot of people I've worked with full-time people are like, when I was your age, I didn't have an internship. And I'm like, Wow, because they're just becoming so much more common. And I also think that students don't really understand that they should be doing some non-tech things. Mm -hmm. I think like reading philosophy or history books or just maybe some more humanities classes can help developers shape products better. So they know what they're building and they know who they're building it for and the possible implications. And I've started seeing, I guess, more full-time people who have been in, in industry for longer. They realize that now, like they have lives, like families and they read and they go home at like five or six, maybe. Whereas I think people my age are starting to think I need to work longer hours, make it my life so I can be better and I guess get farther in the industry. Yep. Cool. 
Well, I don't know if I have anything else I wanted to ask you about or talk to you about. Is is there anything else that you feel like, you know, people could learn from your experience as they're coming in and starting a computer science degree? Get comfortable with feeling uncomfortable. And I used to feel kind of like sad or disappointed when I stayed in late on a Saturday Saturday night, Friday night coding, working on this at working on an assignment, but that's how you get better. It's difficult for everyone and everyone starts at different points in their lives or college careers. And it's never too late to start. I met some amazing engineers who started way after college, no degrees, basically every type of background imaginable. All you need is that drive and anyone can do it. Makes sense. All right. Well, thank you for coming and talking to us and sharing your experience with us. Thank you, Chuck. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and wrap this one up and we will catch you all next week. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.